If we would take a random person anywhere on this planet, the chances today, if we do that today, the chances are actually really good and better than ever that this random person would just happen to be someone who has enough food to eat, uh, has an education, and who will never in their life have to go to a child's funeral. But you guys already know I was going to start with something like that, right? Because you know this talk is in honor of Professor Hans Rusling who repeated a similar message in countless TED Talks. Hans liked to emphasize that uh, global life expectancy is increasing in the world and is now at an average of 70, thank you. So it's a sad and bitter irony of life that Hans himself passed away in February, aged only 68. I'm not going to talk so much about Hans, I think he'd be annoyed with me if I spent too much of my time with you talking about him instead of getting to the, to the point. You see, he was very enthusiastic when he lectured, but he was even more enthusiastic when someone else lectured. When someone stole his lecture ideas and did their own version, that made him so happy. And why? Well, because he really wanted people to have a, wor a worldview that is based on fact and not based on misconceptions. And the facts that he lectured about are such that everybody should have these facts, but instead people tend to have misconceptions that are way off the map in the other direction. And the best way to solve that is probably uh, if as many as possible of us can just do our own version of explaining these facts. Then we could reach even more people, and also when you explain something to someone, you actually understand it better yourself. So uh, that's what I'm doing today. I am here today to go through with you some of the basic facts and trends of human existence, uh, and uh, that will help me understand them better. So thank you guys for being here today to help me with this. I'm sorry to take advantage of you in this very selfish way. This is a picture of all the humans in the world. Can you see us? We are each standing on our individual income, with low income down here and high income up here. All of the countries of today's world are in there. This data is approximate, uh, meaning it's not exact, but it is reliable and it gives a good overall picture. This dotted line down here, this is the UN-defined line of extreme poverty. In 2015, about 11% of the world population lived down here. In some ways, this line is a bit arbitrary because it's not going to be a huge difference for a person if they live just above here or just below it here. But in some other ways, this is the most brutally absolute line in the world, because if you live somewhere here in this corner, your life is going to be a daily struggle just to have food for yourself and for your family. If you live a little bit above it, you will still be pretty poor, but you will have a little bit of extra resources that you can use to make your life better or to make your income more stable or higher. Okay, let's see what has happened during my lifetime. I was born in 1976. And at that time, half the world population lived in extreme poverty. This is adjusted for purchasing power, so it is comparable over time. And this has happened during my lifetime. Some people have gotten very rich, and a lot of people stay here in extreme poverty, but most people have moved over here to a relatively safe distance from the poverty line, where they tend to have two child families, a good education, and pretty okay living standards. Let me show you this development in another way. We'll go back to 1976 again. This is a map of women's education in the world. Uh, in those dark red countries there, women have basically no education at all. But let's move forward, 1976, 86, 96, 2006, and 2015. Uh, nowadays, women have, on average, seven years of education in the world. And in those deep red countries, they have on average one year, which is not so great, but it's better than it was. And if you look at the young women, it's even better. They have on average nine and a half years of education, and in those red countries, it's, uh, the average is around two years. The men remain throughout this period at about one year ahead of the women. This is the young men. Uh, in some countries with long education, the young women have passed the young men, but that's another story. So what about the kids? Of children who, should, who are of the age that they should be in primary school, 91% are in primary school. And you see, the difference between boys and girls have almost disappeared when it comes to uh, primary school. 
But look at this little gap here. 9% of children, that is 60 million children, are not in school even though they should be. And it's a challenge to reach these children because they often live in areas that are very poor or that are hit by war. I'm going to go through this development in yet another way, third way. Here are the bubbles. You know the bubbles, right? Uh, this is another map of the countries of the world. Each bubble is a country. The size of the bubble is the population. We still have money on this axis, but now it's average money by country. And on this axis, we now have survival, measured as life expectancy. Life expectancy is a measure of how, average, how old we are on average when we die. Let's go back, this time, let's go back to 1800. This is the same map, but in 1800. All of the countries of today's world are in there, and it is adjusted for purchasing power, so it is comparable over time. In that time and every time before that, we estimate that life expectancy was about 40. But that's an average, so it doesn't mean that people lived until they were 40 and then they dropped dead. No, it means that child mortality was very high. Uh, of 10 kids born, about four to five died before age five. And then some die, teenager, young adults, in childbirth. We tend not to think about that when we read Jane Austen. Rich people also died quite a lot because they didn't know how diseases spread, they didn't have antibiotics, and hospitals were not so great. Okay, let's see what happens. Are we ready to start time? Am I ready? Oh, okay, start time. See here, time starts rolling. Not so much happens in the beginning. Some of these bubbles move up and down a lot. Those are the bubbles where we have good data for mortality. So we know which years are good years and bad years with high mortality, epidemics, famines. You see, United Kingdom and, and Netherlands are leading the team there in terms of money, but they still have pretty bad health. Life expectancy is still very short. And then France and Germany, U uh, United States starts following there, but life is still very short. But then in the second half of the century, a lot of medical land winnings were done. There's going to be a guy called Jon Snow. He's not from Game of Thrones. He discovered that cholera was spread through water. And then another gay guy named Pasteur, he figured out a lot of stuff about how disease is spread. And then Florence Nightingale and John Lister, they really pushed for nurses and doctors to wash and disinfect their hands and tools in hospitals, which improved survival in hospitals. And then uh, the smallpox vaccine, which was discovered 100 years earlier, was implemented in some of these countries. Uh, there were a lot of discover medical discoveries, but they really found it difficult to implement them. In many countries, people found it very controversial that you got sick by drinking someone else's poop. But then you, we move up here to the First World War, and then at the end of the war, we have the Spanish flu. It's a horrible disaster. It killed more people than the war. But now, see, Japan is also starting to improve. Penicillin is invented there, and there is a famine in East Europe, and then we start, it starts to improve really good. It's looking positive now, right? But then we have the horrible Second World War. I'm going to take a break here at the end of the war. Look, this, this, really, hit, this really hit parts of Europe very hard. And this part of the world is still down here with short lives and uh, very poor. So what happens after the war? Well, during the war, penicillin start mass production. After the war, a lot of these countries get their independence. And also, uh, uh, international collaboration really goes big after the war with the uh, United Nations and the World Health Organization. So let's look at what happens after the war. Immediately, these countries start improving health. It's like a cloud lifting. All of these countries going up towards longer life. China will have a horrible famine there due to bad central planning, but then they recover. Smallpox vaccine is implemented in more countries. Nigeria, there has a war and a famine. And then we will see Cambodia coming down here with this, this genocide. And then smallpox is ex eradicated there. And then in the 1980s, China starts getting richer and having more money. And then we will see the fall of the Soviet Union, yellow countries coming back there. And then in the 1990s, these blue bubbles, African countries, they have the AIDS epidemic and they come down there, it's very horrible, but then they will start turn around again now. Then we have the recent economic crisis, a barely a blip there, and then we come up on today's world. In many ways, this is a very unequal world. The difference between the richest countries and the poorest countries is huge. But most countries are here in the middle. So this is why it no longer makes sense to divide countries into two groups and talk about developing countries and developed countries. Those concepts are outdated. They are not, not useful any longer. And also, look at these countries down here. They have an economy similar to the, in the 1800s, but their life expectancy is much higher uh, than any country was back then. We get more health for the money these days. 
a lot of people, when they are asked, they say that poverty is increasing and the world is getting worse. Why is it so difficult to get into our heads that this, this development has happened? Well, partly because these are slow and long-term trends and they clash with what we see on the news. Partly, I think, because when we see so much misery still in the world, it feels sort of disrespectful to sit in our safe corner of the world and go like, woohoo, everything is getting better anyway. But in other ways, it's also disrespectful to be ignorant of this amazing improvement that has happened in many of these countries. Uh, to have a fact-based worldview, we would need to be curious, we need to have an open mind. We need to be ready to accept facts that go against our current worldview. I'm going to be a little bit provocative here now. I'm going to say that the processes behind this development, as far as I understand, uh, have elements that are popular within some different political worldviews. There are strong elements of economic growth, investments, trade. There are also strong elements of uh, um, tax-funded health care, foreign aid, redistribution of wealth, uh, government regulation and incentives. So if you have a very well-defined political worldview, you might be ready to accept at best only half of this picture. I'm just going to leave that there with you. Anyway, for me as a public health researcher, I'm most interested in the public health efforts that have been made to improve global health. So I'm going to mention some of them. One very important is vaccines. As you saw, smallpox was eradicated. Polio is about to be eradicated. Last year, there were 37 cases of polio in the world. And this year, we might see the last cases of polio ever, or maybe next year. The basic uh, package of childhood vaccines has now reached 86% of the world's children. I'm going to have measles uh, vaccination as an example here. See, at, as measles vaccinations go up, the deaths from measles among children goes down. Measles vaccination has saved millions of children in the world. Then there is this exciting thing about possible new vaccines. Only last week, the World Health Organization announced that they will be pilot testing a vaccine for malaria. If this works, this could be a game changer. Then there are other forms of prevention. You can hand out uh, mosquito nets. Uh, it's important to make sure people have toilets and clean water, work for traffic safety, hand out condoms. Um, it's also very important to reach people with health care, especially for pregnancy and delivery of children. This photo is from Rwanda, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, but they have pretty good survival of newborn babies because they have a general universal health care plan. And then, of course, family planning. When women can decide to have fewer babies if they want, then both the women and the babies tend to have better health and better life prospects. Speaking of this, when some people see this development, then they, some people have this reaction that, okay, but it all, if all these people will survive, then we will have uncontrollable population growth. No, it's the opposite. When people, when families see that babies survive, they tend to have fewer babies. So this has happened in all the world. The number of babies per woman is going down, and the global average is now 2.5 babies per woman. So population growth is already stopping, but it will take some time to grind to a halt. And this is going to be the most complicated part of this lecture. The thing is that the number of children has start, st stopped growing, but the older generations are still smaller. So as they pass on, as they very sadly do, uh, population growth will keep going for a little while, even though the number of children is no longer increasing. Then we will get a little bit older, uh, and then we will end up at 11 billion. And this is already in motion, and very little is going to change this, except a large-scale zombie apocalypse. <laughs> People used to call Hans an optimist, and he always answered, no, no, I'm not an optimist, I'm a possibilist. But that makes sense, right? If you have a realistic awareness of how much stuff has gotten better, you can also see the possibilities. And it also makes it easier to see the problems that still remain. It's like the mist clears and you're like, okay, wow, this thing is on track, but this thing is really a problem still. Let's do something about this. And of course, there are still some big challenges. First of all, of course, there is a dark underside to this beautiful development that we've seen. While all these amazing things have happened, we have really been living above our resources. The airs are polluted, 
uh, there's plastic in the ocean, we're cutting down forests, we're messing with the climate, uh, species are going extinct. We have so much knowledge in the world now, so we need to apply this knowledge and make sure that 11 billion people can live on this planet sustainably and with a living planet, with good living conditions. Uh, another resource we've been misusing is, or overusing is antibiotics. Antibiotics are more valuable than diamonds. They should only be used for very special occasions. Uh, and then uh, a lot of the people who remain in poverty, who don't have schools or health care, they are in areas that have long-term wars or are very hard to reach for very different reasons. So will we be able to reach everyone and how long will it take? And then, you know, for every challenge we defeat, there will be a new challenge. When we defeat diabetes, when we defeat hunger, we will have to deal with diabetes. And when people live longer, we will have increased need for cancer care, for instance. War is also a challenge. This war is this unexpected thing that happens. And currently, we have um, uh, war mortality currently is a little bit higher than, or higher than it was five years ago, but it was is lower than it was 25 years ago. And it's relative, it's very disruptive with wars, but it's a relatively small part currently of global mortality. When we defeat hunger, we will have to deal with diabetes instead. And when people live longer, we will have to have more cancer care. And as you know, the best cancer care in the world could not save a 68-year-old professor who had pancreatic cancer because we still don't have good treatment for pancreatic cancer. There is a lot of research ongoing, including here in Umeå, and they will get there, but for some people it will be too late. So there will always be new challenges in the world. My challenge to you today is that you should make sure that you have a fact-based worldview. And you should make sure that your students and children and colleagues and friends and neighbors also have a fact-based worldview. I think you will do great. Thank you.